In part six, we looked at the west side of the 500 block of Huron Avenue, where the Algonquin Hotel is on one end and Hollywood Furniture on the other. Now let's go across the street uh, to the east side. As we go further out of town, we'll find fewer and fewer pictures. But I think there'll be enough to bring back some memories. There were a lot of different businesses in this block over the years including uh, Harvard and uh, Chevrolet, Barnett Drug Store, Blue Water Hotel, and at one time Firestone was in this block as well. But the very first motel that came to downtown Fort Huron that I remember is the downtown lot here. I also remember that Elias Big Boy was on the corner there too. I couldn't find a photo, but I took this off one of my videos. Here's the oldest picture I have of that corner during this parade. I don't know if it was a recruiting office, as it says on the side of the building there, or more than likely I believe this was the hotel that was on that corner at that time. And as we continue down here in Avenue, we cross Bard Street, and we go into the 600 block of here in Avenue. In the 40s, I remember custom-built tires being on this corner. And then a little further down was Andy Falk, Oldsmobile and Cadillac dealer. This tall building on the end used to be Doc Patterson's office, and I remember he used to be the physician that gave the physicals when I hired him with Firestone. He asked me if I ever had any physical problems, and I said, oh, once when I was a boy I had a spot on my lung on the x-ray. He said, well, don't tell them about that, they won't hire you. Okay, you're good to go. Before we leave the Bard Street area, let's go behind the 600 block on Huron Avenue to Michigan Street on the northwest corner. When I was growing up, I remember going past this building many times and remembering the smells that came out of the open door. And at that time, it was the Cheese Company. But before that, it was the Port Huron Brewery Company. And here we see an advertisement of such. Now going over to the 600 block on the west side of Huron Avenue, we see a very familiar building to all of us, the Salvation Army Citadel. This is what it looked like when I was growing up, and the bottom floor always had some type of business in it. Here we see Flood's vacuum cleaners, and over on the other side we see the barber shop. In this earlier photo, uh, we see the OK shoe repair, and we can identify the barber shop as Grazietti, John Grazietti Barber Shop. But there weren't always businesses in the bottom floor, as you can see here. At one time, the Salvation Army used every part of the building. The Salvation Army was based on a military structure with the leaders the leader of the group being a general and the uh, congregation being soldiers. The Salvation Army wore uniforms just like in the military and they were easily identified on the streets as the Salvation Army, both men and women. The Salvation Army was founded in London, England on the east side in 1865 by one-time Methodist minister William Booth and his wife Catherine. When William Booth became known as the General, Catherine was known as the Mother of the Salvation Army. William preached to the poor, and Catherine spoke to the wealthy, gaining financial support for their work. Booth abandoned the conventional concept of a church and a pulpit, and took his message directly to the people. And these people were the down and out, the drunkards, the prostitutes. The message was simple. Jesus Christ is God's Son. He died for your sins. If you receive him into your heart, he will save your soul. Many other churches believed this message, but they weren't too excited about sitting next to a drunkard or a prostitute in church. William Booth did not feel this way. The following segment is a short two and a half minute 
audio recording by William Booth, a man that was born in the early 1800s. And the fact that we can have him on audio and listen to it today is amazing. And what he's saying can apply to every one of us today. Listen carefully. I am glad you are enjoying yourself. The Salvationist is the friend of happiness. Making heaven on earth is our business. Serve the Lord with gladness is one of our favorite mottos. So I am pleased that you are pleased. But amidst all your joys, don't forget the sons and daughters of misery. Do you ever visit them? Come away and let us make a call or two. Here is a home, fixed in family. They eat and drink and sleep and sit and die in the same chamber. There is a drunken novel, void of furniture, wife of skeletons, children in rags, father maltreating the victims of his neglect. Here are the unemployed, wandering about seeking work and finding none. Yonder are the wretched criminals, cradled in crime, passing in and out of the prison all the time. There are the daughters of shame, deceived and wronged and ruined, traveling down the dark in blind to an early grave. There are the children, fighting in the gutters, going hungry to school, going up to fill their parents' places. Brought it all on themselves, do you say? Perhaps so. But that does not excuse our assisting them. You don't demand a certificate of virtue before you drag the drowning creature out of the water, not the assurance that a man has paid his rent before you deliver him from the burning building. But what shall we do? Content ourselves by singing a hymn, offering a prayer, or giving a little good advice? No, ten thousand times no. We will pity them, feed them, reclaim them, employ them. Perhaps we shall fail with many, quite likely, but our business is to help them all the same, and that in the most practical, economical, and Christ-like manner. So let us hate to the rescue, for the sake of our own peace, the poor wretches themselves, the innocent children, and the Savior of us all. Wow, what a message. Is it more important that we share a love of old buildings, or is it more important that we share the love of Christ with others? And one of the ways that the Salvation Army shared their message was with the Salvation Army Band. It wasn't unusual at all in the 30s and 40s to see this band on street corners. Here they are across from the, gray, the old Greyhound bus station in Omaha Chop Suey. But they would play and people would gather and listen. And then uh, for a while shortly after that, they would share their message of Christ's love and forgiveness. William Booth described the organization's approach this way. He described it as the three S's. The three S's best express the way in which the army administered to the down and outs. First, soup. Second, soap. And finally, salvation. Just to the south of the Citadel, where the parking lot is, there was a hotel there for years. There were some smaller businesses on the bottom floor, but uh, mainly, it was a hotel. It was the McCormick Hotel, and it became the McCormick Apartments. And before that, it was the Briggs, uh, Briggs House, or Briggs Hotel, and then the Wagner House, or the Wagner Hotel. There was another fire that justified the name that Fort Erie had in Matchstick City. A couple of doors north of the Salvation Army was a building I remember this building here, but I remember it as Kaywood Auto. Kaywood's carried the Buick line as well as the Rambler line. As we go up to the 700 block on the east side of uh, here in Avena, we see these stores. I was surprised to see the Wolverine Market here because when I was growing up, Wolverine was on the opposite side of that uh, street, right across from it. And next, uh, 
we have this picture here, which basically shows what I saw growing up as I walked down that way. I uh, had the restaurant, Pittsburgh paint, and this house, this is Walsh Estate, if you look at the sign. But uh, in the directory it says it was owned by Joseph Walsh, who was a trustee. This is directly across the street from that on the west side, and this is where the Wolverine uh, market used to be. And then just to the right of that there, that white building you see there, originally that was a home that was uh, Hank Snyder Marina. But I remember at Christmas time they had a very nice display of Lionel trains in there as well. And on the north corner of uh, that block, on the corner of Glenwood and here, uh, when I was growing up, we went by B.F. Goodrich every day. That was Cliff Lane, B.F. Goodrich. I got my first set of port wall tires here for my car. And for you that don't know what port walls were, those were white rubber strips that made your tires look just like the white wall tires that you bought. And on this picture here, uh, looking down Pine Grove to the south, uh, you get a little different view of the B.F. Goodrich store. And right across the street from B.F. Goodrich, uh, you can see the Texaco sign. That was Keener's Texaco, and that was there for years. Here is a more current view of it today. At this intersection here of Glenwood and Pine Grove and Huron is where this picture here was taken. This is the fire department's latest two-horse vehicle. And the name of those two horses was Patty and Pickles. And this was taken on that same corner. But if you look behind there, you can see that house with the chimneys on top there. Uh, that house set back just off the corner of Glenwood and Pine Grove and Huron. This was the James Golden residence. That was one of the very first homes built on the newly platted Fort Gratiot Reservation. He was a banker and wholesale liquor merchant, and in the late 1800s, he contributed to the growth of Port Yarn. Here's a sketch of what it looked like during that time period. Beautiful home, beautiful setting. And right next door to the north set this home. This was known as the McLaughlin home. It was built in the late 1800s. It's a four-story brick home. And as you can see today, it's the lone survivor in the once fashionable block on Pine Grove between Glenwood and Stanton. On the other side of the street, on the northeast corner, I don't have pictures, but this is where the Beasley School of Music or the House of Music was. And uh, many of you might remember taking uh, music lessons there. And then about a half a block down, see these white houses here. The one on the left used to be a tourist home. It was called Windsor Tourist Home. And right beside it, there used to be an alley that went all the way through to Michigan Street. I'm familiar with that because we lived on that alley in Michigan Street. And uh, we'll swing around there and take a look at the change here in just a second. This is what the alley looks like from Michigan Street, or what used to be the alley. And this is what it looked like when I was growing up. Uh, that's a picture of my father and my sister and myself sitting on the car. And you can see the alley goes through there uh, looking west to here in Avenue. And then right beside the alley facing Michigan Street was our house, which is this picture here. A lot has changed since those days. If we go back further down the block going south again, uh, to the corner of uh, Glenwood in Michigan, on this corner here. This used to be where the Jackson School was. In our next video, we'll go back over to Huron Avenue and go all the way to the end. And we'll look at uh, this building here as we go by, and then we'll take a leisurely walk through Pine Grove Park.